With thanksgiving in my heart, I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made, he has made me glad. And he has made me glad, oh, he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad, oh, he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Amen. Thank you for coming out to Sunday School this morning. We're going to continue our series with Pastor Greg on uprooting rejection. There's Sunday School for all ages, also Spanish-speaking Sunday School as well. And we'll open in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you for all that you're doing. Continue to move in our lives this morning. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4. We're on our final lesson in our series on uprooting rejection, and uh, we've been looking at uh, the principle of rejection and how it affects people numbers of weeks. Last week, we started uh, part one of uh, healing rejection. Today is the uh, part two, and this will be our final uh, lesson, how to get free from rejection. Let's read our main verse, 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Okay, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. So let's uh, look at healing rejection. This is part two. Let's talk about love casting out fear. Rejection, we've been looking at all the manifestations, but ultimately, rejection is an assault on love in some way. Someone gave you the message that you are not loved, that you are not valued, that uh, you're not worth loving in some way. So all of the different effects that we've looked at in uh, the last 14 lessons is, is actually centered on love. And so if we sum up all the things that we've been discussing the effect of rejection, it manifests in love. You have people who are unable to give love. Any of you that have ever counseled with me, I probably have asked you at some point, ask each spouse, do you say, I love you? Can you express love, uh, appreciation? Can you demonstrate or show value or affection? And of course, there are people, if I ask that, what should be a very basic question, they're like, uh, because they have a difficulty expressing love. Uh, on the other hand, we've looked in numbers of ways that uh, rejection causes you to be unable to receive love. There are people that are very uncomfortable with any kind of compliment, um, uh, because they really don't believe it. You look beautiful, yeah, but what about, you know, my, uh, you know, some, something that they're not uh, comfortable with. So this, what it produces then, if you, if love has been assaulted then, all the things we've been looking at, it produces uncertainty in human relationships. We mentioned this, some of you, coming into church has difficulties because you are uncertain around people. You have this underlying feeling that I don't fit. And then, of course, we talk, this affects your relationship with God, that somehow uh, I'm not good enough. He wouldn't like me. I better perform. I better show that I am uh, doing that. All right, so this is where we have been head headed the answer for rejection, if rejection is an assault on love, ultimately, how do you heal rejection? Love. Love is the answer for rejection. So, although we have spent numbers of weeks, we spent 13 weeks uh, uh, looking at all the manifestations, 
Of course, we prayed it each week, and I tried to give you hope leading up to this, but you don't fix rejection by looking at the source of rejection. You'll notice I did not give you a questionnaire, name the 900 ways you've been rejected in life. That doesn't fix anything. The only reason why I have been even bringing up is so you identify and say, I have a problem. You heal rejection, not by looking at the source of rejection, but by looking at the source of love. 1 John 4, 18 is our main verse. Let's read it for the second time now. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Okay. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. Rejection produces fear. It produces fear. Fear of rejection. It produces fear that I'm not good enough, that I, I don't measure up. So how do you get rid of fear in actually any uh, form that it takes in your life? Love. Love is the answer to fear. So love is actually the answer to Rejection. Now, the love we're talking about is not your love for your puppy, your love for ice cream, your love for your children, husband and wife. I am talking about God's love. This is the basis of Christianity is actually the love of God. It is God's love. 1 John 4, 16. And so we know the love of God, the love that God has for us, and we trust that love. God is love. Okay. That is a profound statement. I, I put it in bold. God is love. The Bible is a book about God. There are people in the Bible, but the Bible is not about people. It's all about God. It is about who God is. And this text says God is love. Not just that he loves or has love or manifests love. It says he is love. So that is talking about God is the embodiment of love. God is the ultimate example uh, of love. So think about three simple things about God's love for a moment. And the first of which, Christianity is based on this, God wants to have relationship with you. God wants to have relationship. You don't, you don't have to make him do this. He wants to. 1 John 4, 19. We love him because he first loved us. Okay, he first loved us. When we talked about a performance mentality that you're going to strive, you're going to earn, you're going to deserve, you're going to work hard so that God, how foolish is that? The Bible says he first loved us. Before you ever loved God, he already loved you before you did anything. This is, this is if you... If you can get this by revelation, think about this. The God of the universe was not happy without you. That, that is what the gospel story is. Sin separates. We can't have relationship. God saw you and he said, no, I can't live like that. I can't live cut off from people that I already love. So therefore... He made an incredible effort. Think about it. God came out of heaven in the form of a baby. <laughs> that, was, that was an elaborate plan, suffering all the things he went through in life and then dying on the cross. Why? Because he wanted you in his family. Sin cuts you off, you cannot be in God's family while you're living in sin, and God says, no, I want you to be in the family. 1 John 3, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Okay, this is not meant to be gender specific, but that we should be called the children of God. That would be a better way to put it. What manner of love the Father has bestowed. It's a gift. He didn't say he let you have it and eventually after you really worked hard and you showed him what a performer you are. No, 
this is love. He wants you to be his child. That is uh, who God is. And, and going back to uh, uh, what we read in, in 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. The, the problem with people is that they, they think, okay, I prayed, yeah, all right, I'm going to heaven, but somehow uh, now that God knows what I'm like, that he somehow is terribly disappointed. Listen, he knew what he was getting when he invited you into the family. There's nobody here that you've shocked him after the fact, like, <gasps> maybe we should rescind that be in the family offer and give it to some better people. No, he knew exactly what he was getting. And the Bible says, knowing that we have problems, he wants to help us when we have problems. Ephesians 1, verse 6 and 7. To the promise of the glory of his grace by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Okay. This, this word, part of the problem is the New Testament was not written in English. So in English it comes out, he made us accepted, which is kind of a, you know, to us, accepted is actually a uh, meh word, isn't it? It's like, you know, eh, yeah, it's acceptable. But that we're kind of saying it's not great, but it's okay. That is not what the word means. The word means actually he made us to have special honor, to be highly favored. Who in the Bible did an angel say you are highly favored to? Mary, right? So, but the Bible says that's how he views you. God looks at you and he says you are highly favored. Some of you, if, you're, if you have a Catholic background, this should be really good news to you. God looks at you like he looks at the Virgin Mary. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, <laughs> I am special. Yes, exactly. And so uh, uh, then in the beloved, this, this is, I want you to understand what this means. What makes us highly favored in God? The Bible says, in the beloved, it is because of Jesus. It was very good. And we had a, a, a discipleship class this morning, serious men, and one of the men was asking a great question about, uh, about your past. And I said, no, do you understand when God looks at you, he does not see your past. Right? This is how we think God looks at life. Like God is, is looking at church this morning. He's like, oh, man, they're here. Like, I like that. Oh, it's you. But that's, no, the Bible says, when he looks at us, what does he see? He sees us as acceptable and highly favored as Jesus. He doesn't see our past. So we, we, you, you know, you don't know what I've done. Listen, God doesn't see it. We are accepted, loved like Jesus was loved. That is what you have to understand about God. So the first thought about the love of God, God wants to have relationship with you. The second thing about the love of God is God delights in you. Okay, Zephaniah 3, verse 17. The Lord your God is with you. The mighty one will save you. He will rejoice over you. You will rest in his love. He will sing and be joyful about you. Okay, so, so think about this. Um, if, if, if you had, uh, if you have a, a healthy relationship and you have children, better yet, you have grandchildren, you know what this, this is actually meaning here. So how does God view you? A lot of people is like, God is tolerating me, putting up with me. He's like, listen, Buster, one more mistake and to hell with you. But, but instead, the mighty one will save you. What will he do? He will rejoice. You know what God is saying to some of you? You're here this morning. God is going, yes. And then you'll rest in his love. He will sing and be joyful. How many of you here over your children or grandchildren, did you sing dumb little songs to them? What the heck does bibbidi bobbidi boo mean? I don't know, but I sang it to my daughter. 
grandchildren. Some of you saw, you were smiling. I had my granddaughter in my arms, and I'm blowing on her cheek and making dumb little grandpa noises. <laughs> Listen, I can have a bad day. It's like the world just got better. But the Bible says that's how God views you. I'm not putting up with you, tolerating you, dangling you over hell. In the, if you understand how loved you are, this changes. Love casts out fear. The third thing is because you are loved, because God delights in you, he wants to give you good things. Through the years, very, very uh, interesting to me is there are people that they come up uh, you know, they, they're telling about a, a problem that they have. And I say, oh, shall we pray about that? I say, oh, you know, I, I, it, I don't want to bother God. And I'm sure there are more people with bigger problems than me. That, then you don't understand God's love. Because when you love someone, you like giving them good things. Romans 8, 32. Let's read that. You... He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, shall, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Okay. So this is a logical argument. If you've ever thought to yourself, I don't want to bother God with my problem. So, he didn't spare his own son. Right? That's how much he loves you. The God of the universe willing to come out of heaven and die on the cross for you, that shows that. So it's a logical argument. If he gave you everything, why would he now say, oh, no, no, listen, I, I don't care about bills. I don't care about sickness. I don't care about family problems. No, when you love someone, he will freely, not grudgingly, freely give us all things whatever you need. That's, that's what you have to, have to understand uh, about this. I, I got a, an email uh, this week, uh, last week, someone who's been watching online, and they uh, said that they had gotten a breakthrough. God had done a miracle. They actually heard me preach, and I was obviously preaching about faith, and I made a, a bold statement. I said, listen, whatever situation I face, whatever I'm going through in life, my heavenly father loves me. That is my default position. There, there are problems in life. I don't know how it's going to work out. My heavenly father loves me. That, that scripture says so. So therefore, whatever I'm going, like, I don't know how to fix it, but my father who already didn't spare his own son, I need you to show me how. And I have confidence that my Heavenly Father is going to do that. I have a need in life. God's going to provide it because love gives good things. Luke 12, 32. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Okay, I, I love this scripture. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Pleasure. He enjoys. That is what you have to understand about the love of God. So therefore, if you put those three things together, we, we, we're talking about rejection is an assault on love, is an assault on your identity. Who are you? That, that's the struggle for some of you. I, I'm not worth, I don't deserve, I don't earn. When you understand the love of God, which gives you identity in Christ, accepted in the beloved. My identity is, listen, you know, so some foolish person from the past rejected you, divorced you, abandoned you, abused you. Okay, but the creator of the universe wants to have relationship with you, sings songs about you, so, so therefore, the result of that identity is rest. I don't have to be afraid that I'm walking the tightrope at any moment I'm going to make one step and God's going to go, that's it, I've had enough, the hell with you. No, I don't have to live like that. 
I don't have to earn. Christianity is not a performance. I don't, I don't come performing. God, are you happy with me? I made prayer like three days in a row. Well, I missed that one and I was overslept. And No. What God wants is rest. Hebrews talks about this. Anybody who is a performer never is comfortable. They don't have rest. 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Okay. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to strive. I don't have to earn. I don't have to worry. What does God think about me? I rest. Love is ultimately the answer to rejection. Now, we're going to move on, and then I'm going to open for some questions. I want to talk secondly about possessing God's love. All right. God's love is a fact. It is a done deal. If you have prayed, if you're born again, you ask God to forgive your sins, God's love is a fact that doesn't fluctuate from day to day. I love you yesterday, I hate you today. No, it, it is a, a finished deal. But I, I want to be honest with you here. You have a personal responsibility to make that real. Please, please, please understand this. I have spent, this is the 15th lesson. You know me, I, I have never done a series this long. I've been going in depth to try to help you. So I've given you lots and 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 lots of information. Information alone will do you no good. If you don't make it real for yourself, all I can do is tell you the truth. I can't make it real for you. You have a responsibility about God's love, whether it's going to be real for you. So, what do you need to do to make something that it's true? But how do you make it life changing? Number one, you need to ask God to give you a revelation of God's love. It is not good enough to have information, right? I could transfer from my notes to your notes. If you've got a, an apple, we could airdrop it. But it's not going to help you because the answer is not for you to have it in your head. You need it in your heart, right? You can know about things, but they don't change your life. It is when you have it in your heart that it changes. All right, let's look at our verse, Ephesians 3, 18 and 19. May be, <clears throat> may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Okay, this is the Apostle Paul. It'd be an interesting study for you. It'd be a long study, but be interesting for you to look at all of Paul's prayers. What does he pray for people? So he's praying here. I didn't read verse 17. So he says, I am praying for you. What is my prayer for you? That you may be able to comprehend how big, how deep, that you may know the love of Christ that passes knowledge. What, if that happens, what will happen? You'll be filled with the fullness of God. Paul is saying, I am praying. This word comprehend is not simply agree. It's not mental assent. How many of you believe the Lord loves you? Amen. Oh, got it. We're fixed. No. He says, this is a miracle. I am praying for a miracle that you get it. One of the things that's been so encouraging to me about this series is I've been getting comments, notes, texts, emails, carrier pigeon message, smoke signals, that people have been telling me in practical ways, I get it. Something happened. I, I understand now something changed on the inside. So, if for you the love of God is simply information, like, yeah, I agree with that, and yet there's no rest, you need to do what Paul prayed. Pray 
God, give me revelation to reveal, uncover. Let me understand it, not in here, in here, so that I know it. I can't do that for you. If you want the love of God and you don't get it yet, you have to pray for that. My job is to declare. It's your job to lay hold of it. Second thing, you need to document God's love. How many of you, this is, a, this is a test on how old you are and how long you've been saved. How many of you saw the cross and the switchblade? Okay. In the cross and switchblade, famous old film, remember when Israel is given a Bible and he opens it up and he says, I love this book. Look at this, Israel, 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 I'm in here. Okay. You are in the Bible. The Bible's not about you. It's about God. But you're in there. It applies to you. So if you need a breakthrough from rejection, you need to understand God's love, let me give you some practical suggestions. You need to look, when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which are the four Gospels telling the story of Jesus Christ, look at Jesus how did Jesus treat people? And I'm not talking about the Pharisees. Some people, they read the Pharisees and Jesus said to them, snakes, they go, yeah, that's me. <laughs> no, never mind the Pharisees. How did he, he had people, right? The lady, she's caught in the act of adultery. They bring her naked from the bed, throw her down. How did Jesus, she had issues, right? Any of you, you have issues? You got problems? How did Jesus treat her? You filthy. No. Who condemns you? No one. You're right. Neither do I condemn you. He was kind to people. People had problems and had issues in life. So you need to read the Bible like this. How did Jesus treat that person? That's how he's going to treat me. I'm like that. I have problems. I make mistakes, right? Peter denies him, and then what does Jesus do? Hey, go tell Peter. That's how he views you. You have, in other words, you have to personalize it. You have to read the Bible. I call this personalizing. You read the Bible, and you make it real for you. Acts 2, the day of Pentecost. Peter stood up. They've been reading the Bible for years. And he takes a prophecy from Joel and he says, this is that. That prophecy that we didn't understand, it applies to us today. That is how you have to read the word of God. Any of you have been saved for any amount of time, I, I have uh, told many times the story of how I first started seeing miracles and people getting healed. I was raised in this church. We're Pentecostal. If you're to ask, how many of you believe in miracles? I would have said, amen. The problem is I had never seen one. Never happened, not one. Had ever happened to me. Uh, personally, I hadn't experienced it. I had never prayed for somebody. But I wanted it. Uh, I was in a, a church that was struggling, and I wanted more. So I began to read God's word. And one day, I... I I still remember it clear as a bell, number three, Woodley Place in Gladstone Park in the city of, Vic, uh, of Melbourne, Victoria, Australia. In my office, I read Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I said, if he's the same today as he was back then, that means he will still do for me what he did back then. And it went from here before. Do you believe in miracles? Yes. But I never saw it. Now it was here. And I went to, I was so excited the next service. I told him, you're not going to believe this. God can do miracles. Like today. And I prayed for people. And guess how many people got healed? Zero. But it didn't matter. I didn't care. Because it wasn't in here, it was, in, it was mine. And I prayed service after service, and lo and behold, 
Miracles started happening. All right, I'm applying that to miracles, but that's what you're going to have to do. I can't do that for you. You can read God's word and personalize it and say, that's for me. God, that is what I want. You are able to do that. A simple part of that, the Bible says, when you want something and you see it in God's word, write it down. Our lesson or our, the theme of our last conference was clarity based on Habakkuk 2 verse 2. Then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. Okay, so this is, a, of course, is prophetic and deep and there's a lot to it. But, but basically, God said, anything you write down becomes clear and then you're able to run with it. Did I not just make the King James understandable? Anything, I'm going to say it again. Here we go. Anything you write down becomes clear so you can run with it. So that means if rejection is a problem in love, if you're reading something about who God is and the love of God, write it down. So you don't even know what paper and pen is. Okay, all right. <laughs> write it down. <laughs> write it down. Some way so that it becomes yours. You are personalizing the love of God. The third thing is, you have to receive God's love by faith. Ultimately, Christianity is based on faith. It's a choice of faith. How did you get saved? If you're born again, your sins have been forgiven. How did you get that? Someone declared to you, Jesus died on the cross and God loves you enough. He's willing to forgive you. You weren't there. I wasn't there. But in some way, by faith, you said, that's what I want. That, but that's true for miracles. That's what happened with me. For mir I hadn't seen any, but I said, but God's word says I'm supposed to have it. So by, I believe that. That's true with the love of God. The same way you got saved, healed, filled with the Holy Spirit, God provided for you. In some way, you said God's word is true for me. And this is about the love of God. You have to make a choice at the end of the day. Now, some of you here, you're, you're stuck in a lifetime pattern of, I must try hard, I must do better, I don't really measure up, I'm not good enough, let me perform, let me work it off. That's nonsense. It, it's pointless to do that. Why don't you instead, by faith, say, I am loved. I am loved. Yep. Yep. Some jerk in the past said they didn't want to rate. Okay, but I'm loved. Somebody divorced me, didn't want, but I'm loved. The God of the universe, I accept God's opinion, not people's. And that is the freedom. People who get free from rejection, you're not tormented by people's opinions. Because you don't, I, I love you, but you don't matter. In some way, and I'm saying in a healthy way, okay? <laughs> no doubt there are people, you know, I wish we had a new pastor. Okay, but I don't care <laughs> because I'm not living by people's opinions. I, I, don't, I don't lie awake at night. Like, do they love me? Do they not love me? Every person I shake their hand, do they love me? Do they? It doesn't matter. I'm, I am loved. And that brings great freedom. Okay, let's open for some questions. We got some time. Something you want to ask. Daniel. Uh, a great example of what you're talking about as I was reading Matthew 7. He talks about if we're sinful and yet we know how to give good gifts to our kids, you know, when they ask for, I think it's a loaf of bread, we're going to give them a stone, right? And in the middle of this rejection series, I'm reading that and God's saying, if you can bless your kids just because, where do you think that came from? Now, that's how he thinks about us. He likes to just yeah. bless us. We're never going to deserve it. Sometimes he likes to bless us with really good things and we'll never deserve it. So my wife and I, we've been praying, you know, God, we need you to bless us with a nice vehicle. 
Like, we don't want just, you know, God, if you can spare, if you can just spare the most beat up car, <laughs> please. Like, God, we want a nice vehicle. And he did. He blessed us with a nice vehicle. We were able to get one. Yeah. That's because we have a God that loves us and wants to bless us. Yes. And that is how I approach life. In every human need, my Heavenly Father loves me. I don't know how he's going to fix it, but he's going to do it. I don't know how he's going to provide, but he's going to do it. Because I am loved. That is the basis Everything flows from the love of God. Good. Somebody else, over there. Who's that? Chuck Haynes. Microphone is coming. I have used in uh, altar calls before the um, finding a treasure in a field and selling everything to buy that field. And um, if I could convince you how much God loves you, you would sell everything and go buy that field. You know, but... It's getting them to realize that or come to that revelation. But um, if you knew how much God loves you and how great it is to be saved, you would give up all that stuff and run, run to him and buy that field. Yep. Just come. Yeah, the love of God, the basis. Back there, Isaac. So I've, I've spent some time um, trying to figure out how to explain impossible situations to people like why did someone die or why were you abused and stuff like that. And then through preaching, realized I don't have the answer for people's difficult situations or my own difficult situations. My question is, it, it seems like this is the answer. Yes. Is not the why do bad things happen to good people or why does God allow this? Because that's what we, we tend to blame God. Yep. But if God loves me, that changes my perspective. And then not that it doesn't matter, it doesn't hurt, but that helps me get through life. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So when, when, you, when you love someone, you, you trust them, right? So that's the point. I, I have things in my life that didn't work out, not resolved. If you were to ask me, why did that happen? Don't have a clue. But I love my Heavenly Father. I am loved, so therefore I can leave th that with Him. If you want to tell me someday, great. You don't, that's fine. Talk about it when we get to heaven, if we care. I don't know. We'll see if you, you love God. Yep, uh, Amador. Just thinking about God's love uh, in cleaning this place for 13 years. And my daughter the other day, uh, that we went to the job, they had a, a gay Christmas tree. And like, wow, this ain't gonna happen here. So we complained everything. My daughter was so upset, Leah. And I told her, God, you know, I used to know that God loves us that much that we don't have to put up with stuff like that. So I was thinking about that. That uh, she's like totally changed my daughter about, wow. And the next day the tree was gone. A gay Christmas tree. Wow. Well, the Christmas carol does say, don't we now our gay apparel, I guess. So. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Some of those songs, we ought to change the words now, I'm thinking there. <laughs> Matt. <laughs> so um, how did, when you have an idea, you understand that God loves you, it's head knowledge, but it's hard to accept that. What, what causes people to you know, know that we don't deserve it, but then say, all right, I'm gonna ignore the fact that I don't deserve it and I'm going to be willing to accept it. And what causes some people to not be able to just accept the fact that God loves them and move on with life? You know, in other words, it's like, yeah, I know he loves yeah. me, but me personally. Yeah, yeah. why not? Um, you know, I mean, an obvious answer is pride. Religion is based on pride. It, which is better, you know, uh, I was a worm and didn't deserve anything and I was given good things or I pulled myself up by my bootstraps, right? It's, for some people, it's appealing in pride. But for some, re for some people, exactly why we've been looking at this series, they were raised with harsh demanding, you were never good enough. So it's, it's hard to break out of that mentality, so, you know, which is why we're, uh, why we've been looking at this. But ultimately, if you are struggling with love, the answer is your Heavenly Father, who loves you in the first place, okay? I know kind of in here, but I'm not getting it. I need you to help me break this cycle. I want to receive it. Help me. Because the Bible says faith is a gift. He will help. If our Heavenly Father wants to help us, if we're struggling in an area, tell him that. Right? One of the problems of Christians is, it's strange to me, Christians who 
um, can't be honest with God. I've talked to people like, how do you feel about that? Well, I'm angry at God. Have you ever told him that? <gasps> well, like, <laughs> why not? Do you think he doesn't know? You, so it, it, the most natural thing in the world is to talk to your Heavenly Father about whatever is bothering you. Right. He wants to help you. So in the, you just said a very practical thing, Matt. I am struggling to just receive it by faith. So the answer then is, I need you to reveal it. And therefore, then, of course, what I said is you've got to look into God's word and apply it. Say, that is for me. That is for me when, when he speaks to you. Yeah? Good. Let's, I want to get the last thought, and then we'll have a bit more time. So the final thought is steering your heart. Okay, the Bible speaks about the power of words. Let's read James 3, verse 4 and 5. <clears throat> Look also at his ships, although they are so large and driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. Okay, this is a, a picture out of life is you can take a very large ship. Think about, you know, these uh, super tankers or or cargo ships, they are like football fields long, but they are steered by a rudder. There's a small piece of metal relative to its size, and it turns the whole ship. So the Bible says, your mouth is the rudder of your life. Where do you want your life to wind up? Do you want to spend the rest of your life in uncertainty, tormented by fear, bound by rejection, your mouth is going to have something to do with that. But you want to change exactly what Matt just said. All right, I'm struggling in this area. I want, uh, I need a breakthrough in love. The Bible says your mouth is what's going to help steer that. All right, you need the miracle. The miracle from God is more important than anything. You need to document, write down, make it personal in the word of God, but it involves your mouth. If you're asking God for a miracle but not changing your mouth, it's never going to work for you. So whatever you say does affect your heart. Proverbs 18, 21. The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Okay. You eat whatever your mouth produces. That, that's what that scripture means. Some of you here, let, let me give you an example. In your marriage right now, you're reaping what your mouth has produced for years. You have said nasty, mean, terrible, demeaning things for years, and now you're like, we don't love each other. That's right. You're eating the fruit. Okay, that's a negative example. So, but I'm... <laughs> your mouth if you're going to get a healing and rejection, is two-part, and the first is negative. You have to stop saying things against the love of God. Some of us, our words are protective, right? So, I mean, ladies, you cook, and before you even put it on the table, it's probably no good. We don't have to eat it. We can go out for a hamburger. <laughs> that, that's self-protective, isn't it? Words are, you're afraid, and, and we do this. Yeah, you know, I'm probably no good, and I'm not. It is as normal as breathing for you, but you actually say things that, according to God's word, are a lie. That's not what God says. Yeah, I'm probably not good, but that's not what God said. Accepted in the beloved, is that right? So, you cannot stay with the same speech patterns and be free from rejection. If your pattern is to speak against your identity, and, and, and again, I get it. It's sometimes this is safety. What we think is if I tell everybody I'm stupid, and then they discover I'm stupid, it's less of a letdown <laughs> than me telling them that I am brilliant. They go, no, you're not. You're stupid. <laughs> so I get that. I understand is you're never going to be free. Your mouth has to, in some ways, change. But that's a negative. The second part, we're talking about the love of God. 
your mouth needs to align with the truth of God's love. Jesus Christ did this, didn't he? Jesus Christ spoke his destiny of who he was out loud. John 10, verse 30, one example. I and my Father are one. Okay, Jesus, when he was on earth, he spoke out who he was. So if, you, if you're a new convert, you don't understand what he's saying here. Jesus is saying, I am God in the flesh. He's in a human form, but he is saying who he was. He is speaking identity. Another example, John 3, uh, 35. The Father loves the Son and has given him power over everything. Okay. He is declaring, his, the Father loves the Son. He is saying, I am loved. That's what that verse means. I am loved, and because I am loved, I have been given power. So if Jesus Christ needed to speak out his identity, how much more do we need to do that? that that's my point. When you read God's word, uh, put up this, this next slide. Uh, I want you to just see this. This is just a, a little example when you read. I've given it a title of who God says I am. This is just through two chapters in the book of Ephesians. So you can read the Bible like this. I got to read my chapters today. Okay, done, check, check, done. You can read it like dry theological, like, oh yeah, mm -hmm, that's true, great. Or you can read God's word. Look at all of the statements that are about you because they apply to you. I am blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Chose, I was chosen before the foundations of the world, and these, all of these are found in these verses. I'm called to be holy and without blame in love. I'm adopted in Christ to Father God. I'm accepted in the family of God. I'm forgiven. I have a wonderful inheritance. I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit. And on and on and on, that's who you are. So if with your mouth you're saying, I'm no good and I pray don't measure up and I never do things right, but that's not what God says about you. Your mouth needs to agree with God because the Bible says what you speak, not only does it come from the heart, but it affects your heart. This is why I say to married people, don't talk divorce. I don't care how irritated you are. People who talk divorce... They get divorced because what you say affects the heart. That's, a, again, a negative. But if you talk love, not only to your spouse, if you talk who you are in Christ, for some of you, this is practical. Not every one of those is life-changing for, for you be, by what you're facing right now. But some of those statements are profound Right? Some of you here, yeah, yeah, I was just an accident. Uh, I was a product, you know, mom and dad, and they, they got drunk. No, 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 but that's not what the, God said. He said, I was chosen. You weren't born yet, and God knew you were going to be born. That's, that's life-changing. So you need to say what God says. Final thought in getting healed from Rejection is the power of worship and gratitude. Do you know this? The power of hell is defeated by gratitude. Think about that. When you, with your mouth, thank God for good things that he is or that he has done or that he's promised. Look at Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving... Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Okay, he says, if you live with thanksgiving, the peace of God will do what will guard your hearts. There are people like, what, the devil right now, what if the Satanists are praying against us, if the devil's making plans again? But 
grateful people, God said he'll guard you. Old Testament, Jehoshaphat, enemy <coughs> armies are there to kill them. And God says, go march against the armies, the enemies who are trying to kill you, and do what? And just praise the beauty of his holiness. Say, the Lord is good. His mercy endures forever. Try that next time a bully picks on you. Like, excuse me, the Lord is good. His mercy endures. But the Bible says when they were thanking God, the enemy started killing each other and ran away. So, rejection is an attack of hell against your mind and your life. Right? Clearly that's from hell. If you come into the house of God and you're like, oh, I don't fit, I shouldn't be here, I don't... That's from hell. Gratitude, that's why I sit on the platform and I watch everybody. Let's sing. And everybody, you sing. I had a bad day. No, you need to sing. You need to worship. You need to lift your hand. You need to tell God, God, you are wonderful because something happens in your heart. This brings freedom from rejection. I want you to bow your heads. Now, for the final time, we're going to pray. This, is, this brings our series to a close. And, and I want to pray for you. I'm going to ask God. There are things I can't do for you, but I can pray for you. That's what the Apostle Paul was doing. And I'm going to pray right now that God's going to help you. God, there are people here, they need a miracle of revelation. God, you've shown us from your word all the ways that rejection is alive from hell. And I am asking you, God, the answer is love. Oh, God, what we need is a miracle of revelation. I don't want it to be facts or information or theology. I need it to be theirs. I'm asking, God, that you would open the eyes of their understanding. God, every person that is watching online, make it real to them right now. God, I pray that they would comprehend how much they are loved Bring a deliverance from every manifestation and every lie of rejection. And I'm asking, Lord God, let that begin to produce confidence and peace. Let them be delivered from fear and insecurity and fear of rejection and a performance mentality. Oh, God, I need you to touch them. And I thank you in advance. God, long after this series is over, you can still be working in hearts and lives. Set the captives free. Your love is the answer. And I thank you for the love of God. Let's praise God for his love right now. Let's thank God. Oh, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord God. I'm grateful, Lord God, for who you are. Thank you for the love of God you've given. Thank you, Lord God, for all you have planned for us, Lord God. The goodness of God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. We're going to stop there. The morning service will start at 1030 next week. Pastor Jesse is going to begin a brand new series. God bless you.